welcome to episode 9 of Witness Rugby Chat, the last one before Christmas. I hope you and yours have a great Christmas and a, and a good New Year. Um, it's flown by the uh, the nine weeks that I've been doing this now. Um, got some uh, obviously it'll get a lot easier when the uh, season starts and we've got some games to talk about. Um, so again, always open to ideas, comments, suggestions. Um, just me, as you can see this week um, after Drew's cameo appearance last week. Um, I am working on getting some more guests on the show in the new year and some some interesting ones lined up. And, and as I say. The content that I'll be able to do around match day will be uh, add a bit more of a dimension. I'm looking forward to maybe giving some reviews of matches, my thoughts on some matches, my thoughts on on the performances. I'm really looking forward to that in the new year, and and, and so I hope you are as well. Um, I do want to try and do a fans panel type uh, show at some point as well. Um, with me being based in Warrington, it might not be ideal for some, for some fans, so it may be that I try and arrange it somewhere in Witness. So. Um, if anyone wants to host us, or if any venues want to host us, or if any fans want to get involved, I know I've had a couple of people message me on Twitter, um, please do so and we'll look at getting that fixed up because it'd be great to hear, I know I've got my own opinions as I'm sure you have, it'd be great to hear a few, a few different opinions. In this episode, I'm just going to break down or we're going to look at the fixtures because I know the championship fixtures were released in the middle of the whole Gelling saga and, and all that stuff that went on, so... There wasn't much, we didn't get much opportunity for me to, to run through the fixture list and, and where perhaps the winnable games or the winnable runs are. Don't forget, Witness won just one, I think, of the last, uh, what was it, 27 games or something like that of last season. So a very, um, you know, a very bad run of form. So a clean slate for 2019. And, and of course, I'm sure everyone at the club will be wanting to get a bit of momentum going and some wins. And, you know, I'm sure... The fans probably want that as well, especially to try and get numbers through the gate. So, you know, you'll have all seen these, but I'll, I'll offer my opinion on, on the runs that, that Witness have got. Of course, it's a very tough start. I mean, you, you look at February there, Halifax at home, Toulouse away, Toronto away and Sheffield at home. And certainly the first those first three games, you, you probably couldn't have picked three tougher games uh, to start off with. But then... Is there a benefit to playing the, the hard games first? That's up for debate. Halifax at home, really good first game. It'll be competitive and it'll be a real barometer. It's a it's a real uh, a real stern test really for a first competitive game for Kieran Pertle as coach because Halifax are an established team in the championship. Richard Marsh has been there for years. They've got a very settled squad as we saw in last week's Witness Rugby Chat. We went through all. Uh, the, sorry, the top seven starting 13s. Halifax have got a, a really solid um, team and, and that'll be a real test. You feel that Witness really do need to get underway with a win, as I'm sure every club would think the same. Um, so that'll be a real a real test on the opener. To lose away the second game, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to make that one. I've not, I've not had a massive scout around for flights yet, but it's, it's far from ideal uh, that early in the season. Uh, I'm sure a few of you will be who were looking to looking forward to having your summer holiday there are a bit disappointed. Uh, certainly when we were in championship last time it was always July August time. I know I went all three times in the championship and the weather was always brilliant. Toulouse, of course, always very strong at home. So I think that's one of the games that you'd probably expect well not expect to lose, but that you would maybe not be not mind so much if, if Witness were to lose that one. Um, I guess from a Witness point of view, it's, it's, it's better to play them early in the season when it's not scorching hot. Um, and also, I mean, one of the sort of tongue-in-cheek comments I think I made to someone last week was there's less time for Witnesses, uh, Witness to get injuries before their, their first few games. So you'd like to think that Witness can have the strongest their strongest possible line upon the field for all three of those first games, Halifax to lose in Toronto, which will give a real, a real indication of where where the current team is at, and then on the so that's on Saturday the 9th of February, and then it's Saturday sixteenth of February is Toronto away. Now this isn't going to be played in Canada, much to mine and many others' disappointments. It's going to be at Newcastle at Kingston Park, which is an artificial pitch. I went there a few years ago when Witness played a pre-season game there. It was largely the under 19s 
Um, it's a really nice facility, really nice pitch. The Newcastle Falcons rugby union team play there. So it's going to be a double header as well. Uh, is it Newcastle Doncaster? I think the game before. So it'll be a good day out for, for a rugby league fan, that one. Um, the weather might not be so good in, in Newcastle in February, but interesting how that pans out for Toronto. I know people saying, oh, it's better to play them at Newcastle than it is in Canada, but then I would probably argue that given that Toronto are largely based over here anyway, there won't be any noticeable difference for either team at that stage of the season, but it, it will at least give an early indication of of where witness stand in, com in comparison to Toronto. I think I'd certainly rather play them away early on than at home. So looking after that, after the, the tricky first three games, it's Sheffield at home, back to back at home game, Sheffield at home, and then Featherston at home on the 3rd of March. There's a potential banana skin away at Barrow on March 10th. We saw last season that Barrow did really well at the start of the season. They turned over Lee and then got that draw against Toronto, really played the conditions really well. Uh, then there's Bradford at home, which again is another real barometer of, of where witness will be in the middle of March. Um, then it's Rochdale away, then there's a Challenge Cup round, then it's Batley away, then there's another Challenge Cup round. Good Friday at home to Lee, Easter Monday away at York. Now, I can't let the Easter weekend go by without bringing up the fact that Toronto and Toulouse not in the Challenge Cup. It means that they'll have two free weekends out of three in the lead up to Easter weekend, which gives them a little bit of an advantage in terms of, of fresh players. Um, you know, whoever, you know, I know Toronto will argue it's not their fault, but you know, that's the case. And um, I think it's just one of them examples of something that an integrity sapping thing in, in rugby league. And there's a few of them that I'm not particularly fond of. Um, you know, it's not Toronto and Toulouse's fault necessarily, but gives them a little bit of an advantage. And, you know, Witness got that tough fixture at home to Leon Good Friday and a potential, you know, a real tough away trip to York on the Monday because if the the Good Friday game takes a lot out of you, you know, to then turn around and go to York, who, you know, good fan base up there, going to be a, a, a tough, a tough one there. Um, especially, I don't think York will be up there in the league. I think even though they won League One, I don't think they've really recruited anyone of, of any note. And, but they might grow into the season. They'll certainly be tough to beat at home. Um, after Easter, then it's Dewsbury at home, then Swinton away, and then there's another Challenge Cup round, and then it's Summer Bash, Lee. Um, again, another example of the integrity, sapping nature of rugby league sometimes is, of course, that Lee game is your extra game. And as we saw with Lee last year, the fact that they played Toronto at Summer Bash was effectively why they didn't finish in the top four. So Lee will certainly be a tough game. I think Lee... Um, not many people were talking about them until the past couple of weeks when they've started signing players and I think they're building a tidy little team obviously playing they're getting players for the right reasons you know John Duffy's leading them they're, they're really looking at getting local players and, and players who who, who want to play for the shirt and it's, it's really good to see I think they probably need a few more forwards but they've certainly got the potential there and certainly with the halfbacks that they've got in Ridgeyard and Woods um, you know they'll be a threat to any team Week after some backs, it's York at home. Um, then there's another weekend off in June, which again is a Challenge Cup thing. The 1895 Cup, a few people have been asking me, um, is going to be midweek largely, I'm, I'm led to believe. So how it works is the eight League One teams are going to be playing each... Uh, sorry, eight of the 11 League One teams, so uh, North Wales, West Wales and London Scholars aren't playing in it. Um, the other eight teams play each other and the four winners of those ties will go and join the 12 championship clubs which is basically the 14 championship clubs but not Toronto and Toulouse um, in the last 16 so effectively you've got to win three games to get to Wembley so my understanding is they will be played in midweek in June and July time which hopefully if the weather's nice it'll uh, that'll, that'll boost the summer that'll, that'll boost the coffers in the summer and, and, and give a bit, of, a bit of extra summer rugby league um, it's nice to see Sundays throughout this list as well, as I'm sure some of you will agree. So in June, Barrow at home, Featherston away, Batley at home, Bradford away. So a nice home away, home away, isn't it nice? A consistent championship fixture list. Uh, and then in July, it's Rochdale at home, Halifax away, Toronto at home. Um, in August, it's Sheffield away, Toulouse at home, Lee away. And then to round off in September, it's Swinton at home and Dewsbury away. So... Uh, Sheffield away being on a Friday night, that's the only actual non-Sunday game um, apart from 
uh, sorry, apart from the Easter weekend and of course the Toronto and Toulouse away games, which is Saturdays at the start of the season. So there's no excuses anymore. The games are, you know, when the games are, they're all there. They're all Sundays, three o'clock. So, you know, looking forward to the season and, um, and hopefully, hopefully we'll see a much better witness team, much better witness performances this year. Um, I think we yeah, we touched on this last week. I think Toronto will finish first. I think Toulouse will finish second. I think Witness, I put them down as, as third place at the moment. Um, I'll probably go Halifax fourth and Lee fifth. But I think Lee are really going to be. It it feels weird to describe Lee as dark horses, but I certainly think that um, they're going to cause some bother to some to some teams next season. Um, so I wanted to touch on this, and it was something that I put on Twitter. So the club released the match day ticket prices and um, keen to know what everyone's opinions are of them. Um, I think the frustrating thing for me is that it's, I think it's just too complicated, the match day structure. I mean, sorry, this isn't a witness criticism. I think rugby league clubs in general are guilty of this, where it's just very difficult for a casual fan to look at something as a glance and figure out how much you know how much they've got so like i've got i've printed it off so that's a list there of all the prices there's 27 different price points for witness games now i'm sure it's more that i'm sure there'll be other clubs where it's more um so you've got standard pricing for adult concession junior you've got silver pricing for adult concession junior you've got um Gold pricing for adult concession junior. You've got members advanced and match day pricing for each one, and it's just like, how on earth do you sell that? It's just like, to me, I'd just be like, right, it's twenty quid, whether you pay in advance or whether you pay on the day. If you're a member, you get ten percent off, and if you want gold or silver, it costs X amount to upgrade. I mean, how much easier is it that to explain? Whereas if someone says, how much is a ticket? Oh well, if you buy it in advance, it's twenty. On a match day, it's twenty-two. If you know a member, it's eighteen. If you want to sit in out silver, it's twenty-four. But that's twenty-eight, and it's just like, oh, I mean, it's hard enough for rugby league to sell itself as it is without making it complicated like that. So, um, again, not a criticism specifically a witness, but. Um, of rugby league in general. Um, price wise, I know a few people have commented. Um, twenty pound, well, twenty two pound on the days. Certainly, I wore to win. I suppose for for championship rugby. Um, junior, ten pound on the day. Eight pound advance. I think you know. It, it, would there be any harm in having juniors as a five? I'm not too sure. Um, I think twenty pounds fairly reasonable. I think if you went twenty pound and five pound, I'd have no complaints with that. I know a lot of people are saying, well, the stronghold's great value, and I don't doubt that the stronghold's great value, but I think when you look at where witness are at, you've got a lot of people who've lapsed, a lot of members who've lapsed, you've got a lot of people who've walked away for whatever reason over the past few years, and you've got to try and convince them to come back, and are you going to be able to convince them to come back by paying 22 quid on the on the day? You know, I'm, it, uh, it's a tricky one, that one. Uh, you know, yeah, don't doubt that the stronghold's good value, but at the same time, y y people may not want to commit the two hundred and odd pound for the whole season. They might just want to pick and choose the games until they catch the bug again. And the same with casual fans in many ways. It, ultimately, there's different types of supporters. You've got your diehards who'll be there no matter what. Um, wait, uh, rain, wind or shine. You know you whatever however much money it is you know the sorts of people who are always there and you know you've got them kinds of fans you've got fans who who perhaps go around work you know they they, they do the, they do their best to fit it around work of course the sunday games are better and you know there's no there's nothing that says that different types of fans are, are more worthy than others and you know i don't really buy behind that everyone's got their own circumstance everyone's got their own reason behind the game you know like there's a lot of people discuss about match day experience to me i'm not bothered about that i just go to watch the rugby i mean they could be playing we could be playing on a park and on the moon or something i don't know you'd still be there to watch the rugby whereas to some people that match day experience stuff actually adds to the uh to the occasion so like you know you've got casual fans you've got new fans you've got maybe sort of fair weather or part-time type fans who maybe just come for the big games or come for the for the for the for the big cup games and ultimately you want to turn as many of them into the diehard as possible and diehard may not be the right word because ultimately that the diehard fans are the ones that 
put the more the more die fans the club has, it you know selling stronghold, buying shirts, whatever, the more money the club makes. So um, I think, and from my point of view, the reason why the ticket price and stuff in rugby league gets on my nerves a little bit is because that's an obstacle to getting someone on step one of this ladder up to being a diehard fan. If you imagine that being a diehard fan is being at the top of the ladder, la- you know, rung number one is you're a brand new fan at your first game. Rung number two is you've been three or four games. Rung number three is you're a casual game, you pick and choose. Rung number four is like, well, you come most of the games, but you've not got a season ticket. It's like, I think the it's almost like in rugby league, you've got someone stood on the ladder with like their hand out saying, you know, we're going to make it as hard as possible for you to get on step one of that ladder, but if you don't go on step one of that ladder, you're never going to reach the top of it. So, um, so yeah, I do think, I just think it'd be a lot easier from a marketing point of view. you just got to make it as easy as possible. You know, all these rugby league clubs are playing in front of half empty, half empty, uh, in, in half empty stadiums, and it's just like, just make it as easy as possible um, for fans to, fans to come in. Um, I did say that I was going to offer some, some of my own thoughts, and I've sort of, ended up going into that in this one so I, I suppose we can ca- I can carry on with that I know I think the, the club are working on this but you know I don't understand why you can't just buy a season ticket online um, especially in the north stand because it's unreserved I understand that you know developing a system to be able to choose your seat in the south stand is probably you know cost prohibitive but you know realistically you could whack a product up on the website for a 250 quid stronghold or whatever it is they can buy it you know all the details go in and you know, voila, it's there. And I think, I think I've said this a few times, if that facility had been available last season, I'd have probably bought my season ticket when I was in Catalan after the, the win over Catalan. Uh, and as it was, I just never got around to it. And um, I just think, you know, again, you just got to make it as easy as possible for people to get the tickets, to pay the money and to get involved. The dream ticket, I think I've signed up for that twice and, I'm, you know, I'm not in it anymore. I don't really know. And again, that's something you can't really do online. You've got to do the direct debit mandate and post it in. And, you know, and I'm obviously different. I'm from a digital background and, and of course, the, that sort of generation. But the reality is now that everyone under 30 basically is living on the phones and, and growing up with expecting everything at their fingertips. So to anyone under 30, to have to print something out and it's just an obstacle to to getting their money, which is ultimately what you're trying to do. Um, I think the new shop with the kit and stuff's good. You know, the online shop, that's good for the club. I think the club really does need a new website. Um, I'm hoping maybe to get someone on to talk about that in a few weeks. I think, I mean, club websites are a very um, interesting thing because depending on what club it is, it serves a different purpose. You know, for, for Man United, they it's just a portal for them to sell tickets and, and merchandise and, and of course it is the very much the same for witness but for clubs like witness there's also the content side of it you know ultimately people know about man united no matter what content goes on the man united website whereas for witness creating good content and putting it on the witness website is a good way of driving traffic which then converts into ticket and merchandise sales now, I think Witness is missing a trick because they've got two great lads who know Rugby League inside out and who are producing good content, but they've not got the platform to really, you know, maximise its potential. So, you know, Witness's social media is a lot better than it, than it was certainly three or four years ago. And, um, and, and I see this on the forum a, a lot where um, people say, oh, I've not got Twitter, I've not got Facebook, so I've not seen it. And it's like, for me... The club could redevelop the website and, of course, integrate. I know there is a bit of integration of the social platforms on there already, but just make it better. Make that the focal point. If you're going to do interviews on Facebook and Twitter, then find out what you know. Make sure that the the push through to the website so the people we have without Twitter and whatever. I know anyone can go on it, but people aren't to know that. Just make it a little bit more accessible. Um, you know, it just feels to me that the same website's been there for years and years, and it's just a bit stale. You know the fixtures isn't great. You know there's no direct link to to see the tickets. There's no, you know, f- even going through even the menus and stuff and trying to find stuff's hard. You know you go on the stronghold page and it still references Super League and August and stuff like that. And I just think even like the URLs, it'd be great if you just had witnessvikings.co.uk forward slash stronghold for instance. You know then you could market that. You could put that on your advertising. You could put that you know on the billboards whatever. Whereas at the moment they've not really got that facility um i know a few people have asked me about stronghold as well i think the club have said that they're open to get them out this week i, I can't 
that's second hand information. No one's told me that directly, but someone's told me that who'd spoke at who'd been to the shop. So um I don't know what everyone's opinion on this is, but I'm not, I've never been fussed by the stronghold stuff. Um the freebies, I mean like I say I'm I'm in that I'm in that sort of category of fan where I'm not really bothered. I, I I just want to go to the games. I you know I I, what, I go to all the games. I just want to watch my team. You know I might buy a shirt, whatever. I buy stuff from the shop if they've got my size or if there's something I like. I'm not you know if I get a car sticker or a bag or whatever. You know, it's, it's not it's not particularly of, of interest to me. But then that's not to say that you know I, I wouldn't appreciate it. Um, I think my issue with the stronghold stuff is that everything's always stronghold branded. But what's you know what's the stronghold? I mean. I think I've only ever seen one or two people wearing the Stronghold beanie hat. And it's like, if that beanie hat had the witness logo on, I'd wear mine. But I wouldn't wear it with the Stronghold thing on. Because it's like, what's a Stronghold? I'm not I'm not a Stronghold, you know, I'm not proud to be a Stronghold member. I'm proud to be a witness fan. Um, and yeah, I do think that that's missed a trick a little bit. You know, even with the drawstring bags, it's like, could you imagine if every kid who got that drawstring bag was using that drawstring bag in school or whatever and it had the witness logo on whereas it's got the stronger logo on so it's like well, what's that and i just think if you think about the money that it costs to produce all that stuff they could have over the over the last three or four years every person who had a membership could now have a drawstring bag a scarf and a hoodie or uh, not a hoodie a beanie with the logo on that they're wearing out and about which then means that when you're walking around witness town center you see the logo all the time and i think i think that's um you know i think that's that's what, that's an interesting something that i I'd, I'd maybe change i think the stronghold i think the problem i think the stronghold was a great idea but probably not for a club of witnesses size so i think the problem is is people have associated the stronghold benefits as a cost instead of as a, a value um, and that all stems from when it started, there was the season to get the stronghold was separate. So people's perception was because the price is 250 quid, well, 50 quid of that was the stronghold because previously they'd paid them separate when the reality is that the stronghold just adds value to your season ticket. Um, whereas, and I think obviously there's been a, you know, fans have obviously misinterpreted or it's been badly communicated at some point, but, um, you know, I think. I think if you if that if, if you were Liverpool Football Club and you had a membership scheme where you got discounts in places in Liverpool, you may pay that separately. Whereas I think the problem is being with witnesses that it's actually acted as a deterrent to stop people buying season tickets, which is obviously counterproductive. Um, it'd be interesting to see how that develops. Obviously, you know Brian, who's worked very hard on on the stronghold over the years, is leaving. So it'd be interesting to see whether. Um, that carries on and it's in its in its the way it is at the moment. I mean, like I say, I think I think the whole the whole concept behind it was great. Um, it's just whether it suited witness or, or whether it suited the size of the fan base, if you like. So, um, I mean, I don't. I mean, you know, feel free to comment about what benefits you use. I think I only ever used the Nando's one. Um, was it twenty percent off in Nando's and that changed? So I think I think it changed to a start. I've never used it since. So um, I think that's the only real benefit that that I ever used. Um, you know, it's a good way to get in with partners and stuff. But then, having said that, is getting discounts for witness fans. Is it really benefiting anyone? Because okay, yeah, the fans are thinking, oh well, that's it. I can get ten percent off here, but. What are the club getting? You know, obviously we don't we're not privy to what the deals are, but are the club getting a kickback? You know, we don't know, and it's a bit like I don't know. We we'll see what we'll see what happens with that. But yeah, I think for me the stronghold stuff, I'd be I'd just have the witness logo on it all, and you know, you probably see, I couldn't even tell you where any of the stuff that I've got over the years is. The other thing is it it comes out of date in twelve months because it's got the year on. Um, you know, so you know, I remember I think I've got a. I think I've got a Witness Viking Super League 7 wallet from years ago, which is like, well, you never use it because Super League 7, it, and it was in there. So yeah, there's a few little things like that that um, that could maybe change. I know, uh, just a shout out as well to Sonny off the forum who said about supporters clubs. Um, maybe the club should look at integrating supporters clubs again and, and maybe getting them to to fundraise um so you know we had the lady vikings and you know the independent sports club and and people like that um and yeah you know of, of course i think if i think there's been a little bit and rugby league is paranoid i think in general 
and and this isn't necessarily a criticism of witness because the RFL are exactly like this where I think there's a little paranoia that the that they don't want fans or people outside of the club to organise things or do stuff without their without almost their say or print on it. Um I might have interpreted that wrong, I don't know. Um and it's like if you've got people who want to arrange I don't know, I don't know what the ladies' nights were like, obviously, but you know, if you've got people who want to organise a ladies' night, just let them. Um, obviously, there's a little bit of blurred lines when people start asking for something back. If there's people willing to do stuff for witness, no strings attached, we'll raise money, you know, we'll run the Christmas do, we'll run the end of season dinner, all the money goes to the club and there's no one taking money out and there's no one wanting, a, you know, wanting to sit on the board for doing it, then I think it's a no-brainer to just mobilise it. You know, there's clearly fans who are passionate about witness. There's clearly fans who want to raise money. There's loads of fans who are very defensive and very protective of the club as well. They should be. And these are the people, surely, as a club, you can trust these people to be able to organise it. I know there was a bit of fuss over, was it the end of season dinner was just open for sponsors? And it's like, well, it's a bit of a shame that there's no, you know, fans thing for that. And obviously it's not been ideal the past couple of years, but it, they, these are some of the reasons why the situation has got to, to where it is. So, um, so, yeah, certainly an interesting one. I think, you know, if, if there's a way that, that fans can raise money for the club and, and put it in the club coffers without, you know, without prejudice almost and without demanding s something back, then then that's surely, surely good uh, for anyone. Um, it'd be interesting to see what happens next season with, with the pitch and whether there's any additional plans for that. I think... There's also the cash turnstile issue. I know people mention this to me all the time, and that's probably more a council-related issue. Um, but yeah, it is certainly last last season was the first time in twenty years that I was having to buy tickets for each individual match because I didn't have a season ticket, and I must admit it was a bit of a pain in the backside walking around the ground to the south stand and then walking all the way back around, and that makes me sound lazy, but that's just the way the way of the world I suppose it'd be a lot easier if you could just rock up and give you 20 quid especially because it costs two pound more on the day so um, you know not only have you got to uh, get around to the to the ticket office window it's also costing you more than a, than if you'd if you'd managed to go to the shop in, in the week so so yeah they're my thoughts um, a little bit of a personal opinion type show this week uh, I won't. I probably won't be here next week. It's Boxing Day, of course. Um, but I'll try and fix something up for the following week. Um, you know, like I say, if you've got any suggestions or any feedback, or you want to see anyone, please let me know. Please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please do subscribe to the podcast, which is available on iTunes, Spotify, and on Audio Boom. Please tweet me at JDG Sport. Um, have a good Christmas. Enjoy whatever you're up to, and I will see you in the new year.